no. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much, O Lord, for every moment we get to spend to get in any means, virtual or face-to-face -face or whatever, with you in our midst, whether in a park or on a beach or in a building or in a church or a POW, like in anywhere, Lord. Um, Lord, you said, you promised, if two or three are gathered in my name, I will be in their midst, and I see more than two or three so I thank you in advance, Lord, for being in our midst. Um, I hope the people that ask the questions are in the meeting, uh, and if not, that they will view it later so they can get the question answered. And I hope that you will touch our hearts, Lord, where in whatever areas we need to be touched. We ask you to please hear us through the intercessions and meaning all you saints and martyrs who please you from the name of the mighty, powerful, love given cross and the blessings of the 50 beautiful days of your glorious resurrection. Please, O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Christ Jesus, our Lord, who now is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All righty. Um, let me no i can't do that okay that's what i need to do okay so we are let me see maybe i can mm -hmm. full screen no i don't want to full screen okay so uh we're going to resume with our uh q a and questions uh y'all again i'll say this probably a few times as we go through if you have any comments questions uh additions anything you want to add or ask or or whatever just jump in at any time one thing i did i was thinking about that i wanted to say regarding the question about um uh the tips or practical ways to, from reading the bible there was one more point that i want to mention <clears throat> and I'm I, I'm guilty of it, and I, and I think we all are this day and age. Which is this: after you're done reading the Bible, and you know applying all the other points that we mentioned, that you don't just close it, um, and immediately just get up and get to your business and all that stuff. Just take a little bit of time in silence and just let the word soak in. You don't have to do any effort. You try to med meditate or contemplate or come up with something or just sit there quietly for 30 seconds, one minute, something like that. It doesn't have to be long. <clears throat> and uh, let's do this. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to move. Uh, some stuff wrong. Okay. Now let's resume with the questions. Question number thirty-two: <clears throat> Is Elijah coming back to Earth a metaphor of John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus, or is Elijah in his physical form going to come from heaven? And uh, if he does, will we recognize him? uh elijah this is not a metaphor elijah will be coming back physically <clears throat> excuse me in his body not metaphorically um we know this from the book of revelation that the when the chapter 11 when the bible tells us about the two witnesses that will come back and witness for the lord and uh, the words will be like fire and weapons and they can shut the heavens from rain and do all that stuff um, and eventually they will be martyred uh, for Christ. So those we believe that those are Enoch and Elijah, the two people who did not die in the body. Um, and this kind of has to happen because all human beings have to die in the body, except at the very end uh, of, of, of time. So, how was that? Uh, just heard a weird sound. Um, they're not going to come from heaven. I don't know where they are. <laughs> I don't know if it'd be paradise or, or heaven or what, but I don't think they're in heaven yet because I don't think 
haven't has been opened for us yet. We'll talk about that, I think, in one of the questions talking about um, uh, paradise and heaven. Uh, okay, so that. Are there other sources besides St. Tecla's website that can help clarify verses if we don't understand them? Uh, oh gosh, yeah. Um, uh, I like CCEL, there's uh, Katina, um, their um, church fathers, goodness. You can like, for example, do St. John Chrysostom on the Gospel of St. Matthew or Church Fathers on, you know, John 5, 7, or something like that. And you'll find stuff that will come up. Katina is a good, easy, quick way to get little excerpts from what they said. Um, but yeah, there's lots of uh, other sources than Sentec. I like Sentec, that's a good website. Okay, so let's move on. <clears throat> 33. I know this may be sketchy a question, but I read different things online by Jewish people saying that the original Hebrew translations that us Christians use as messianic prophecies for Jesus are not accurate in regards to the translation. How as Christians can rebuttal different claims made like that? Um, you know, this really kind of makes sense because they believe that they believe that those prophecies are messianic, but not about the Lord Jesus Christ because they don't believe that he was the Messiah. Um, they believe that they are messianic, but about a different Messiah. Uh, so basically, they're sticking with their story. The, the, the Jews that did not believe and become Christians then, and these are kind of followers on them. Um, okay. <clears throat> when talking with a Jew, uh, a Jewish person, I think it's a little bit easier than talking with an atheist or an unbeliever because Jews believe the Old Testament. So we can use that. An atheist, you can't really use the Bible to uh, prove something to them. Well, the verse says dot, dot, dot. So therefore, you should believe it. You can't do that with an atheist. But with an, a, a Jewish person, you can use the Old Testament for that, the Torah, and the Talmud. Um, I would begin by reminding them of Jeremiah 31, 31. It's easy to remember, Jeremiah 31, 31, okay? Because they think it's the same covenant, it's one covenant, and it remains the same, and it's a continuation of that covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, Behold, the death coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that, took, uh, that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. So it's saying that the covenant that they are waiting for, or the Messiah that they're waiting for based on that covenant, there's a new covenant that, that has more in it. And maybe they would, you know, hopefully uh, accept that, but can see that this can be negotiated. Uh, or argued or debated. One of the uh, <clears throat> my favorite yeah, the arguments that prove that our Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of Mary and Joseph, Saint Mary and Saint Joseph, um, is actually uh, statistics and numbers. If you know me, you know I love numbers. One of the things that I was trying to prepare an answer for this question that I came across is um is this so the the old testament has about 200 prophecies in general um but 300 of them are they're called messianic prophecies they're prophecies that point that jesus christ of nazareth the one we worship is the messiah the awaited messiah so the statistic statistician did the numbers and they said okay it, the chance of one individual living at the time of Jesus in the first century filling only eight out of those 300 messianic prophecies is one 
in 10 to the power of 17. Now you're all college students and recent grads and Sharif Acer, so like this should come in 10 with 17 zeros after it. That will be to give you an idea, which I like that the analogies. Uh, that will be equivalent to covering the whole state of Texas, which is the biggest state after Alaska, you know, the biggest land state, with silver dollar coins two feet deep, and then expecting a, a blindfolded man to walk across the state of Texas, and you mark one of those dollars with like a Sharpie or something, okay, and you put it in this pile, and you blindfold a person, you expect them to walk anywhere across the state of Texas, and stick their hand in, and pull out that one coin, okay? Two feet deep of dollar coins covering the entire state of Texas, and have, that's the chance of that person sticking in their hand and picking up the right coin, the marked coin, from the very first try, while blindfolded, I mean. <laughs> okay, if you add eight more prophecies, so, I mean, 16 prophecies out of the 300, the chance of one person at the time of Jesus, first century, um, fulfilling the 16 prophecies is 10 to the power of 45. Now it's 10 with 45 zeros. So they said this, if you take 10 to the power of 45 silver dollars and make a ball out of them, okay, and place the center of that ball where the center of our sun is, Okay, this big silver ball's outer edge would be approximately the same area that Neptune orbits on the sun. Okay, um, one man fulfilling all 16 prophecies by sheer chance would be like sending a blindfolded person to go into that big ball somehow, it's a CD sphere, okay. And from the first time, handpick that one of a dollar, that marked silver dollar. Um, it's like unfathomable, right? There's no way. I'll add a, just another notch, another step, okay? They said, okay, if you take only 48 out of the 100 prophecies, it's like not even one sixth of them, okay? The chance of one person at the time of our Lord Jesus Christ in the first century fulfilling all those 48 prophecies is 10 to the power of 157. I don't even know what that means. Okay, so this statistician, he happens to be also an astronomer. And so this, this helps us. Okay, so he said, okay, for the dollars, that's the deal too big. He said, if you get uh, 10, to the power of 157 electrons. I can't do this, like it's, okay. Not atoms, but electrons. And pressing them into a solid ball, a solid 3D ball, made entirely of just electrons. This ball would pretty much fill not only our galaxy, but the entire known universe with at least six billion light years in all directions. That's how big that sphere would be. And not only that, that universe would have to be filled with the atoms about 10 trillion, trillion times. I don't even, I, I can't, my brain is like, I can't even imagine that, okay? And having a blindfolded person stick the end and pick the right marked atom, if that's even possible. Now, a person fulfilled all 300 prophecies. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to get it. There's nothing that we can imagine or have that can match all that. It's just at one in infinity. I think in just 48 prophecies in one in infinity. It's just, it's unfathomable. And, and numbers don't lie. I love numbers because they're predictable. They're always honest. They are truth. They are what they are. So... People who, you know, people will say what they say. People will have to things to kind of defend their belief. Um, but just we're looking at, okay, the Old Testament has been written before our Lord was born. He matched all 300 messy prophecies. You go figure that out. Um, 
how many total messianic prophecies you said there were in total? 300. Oh, in the so Old like Testament. 300 out of 300, you says? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. There's a total of 2,500 prophecies, I think, about 2,500 total prophecies. But 2,200 of those don't are specifically about our Lord Jesus Christ, They're just general prophecies. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So there's just no way. Actually, I think I copied the link. Let me see if I have it pasted. Nope. Um, if anybody wants to text me, I'll send them the link to that uh, article, that study. And that's my cell number uh, in the chat group there. Um, I'll have to get out of the presentation to copy something and then paste it in here. I copied the link, but then I copied something else over it. But you can uh, text me and um, I'll, I'll send you that uh, link. Um, so, okay, you know, everybody can claim whatever they want. You know, like, like uh, the Muslim people uh, claim, yeah, 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 Jesus did die, but like, he was on the cross, but God replaced him with somebody that looks like him. Um, so yeah, everybody can believe what to help, you know, sleep at night. But we have, Yanni, yeah, I want you to be so strong in, in your faith and in, in your evidence. Just look at numbers. There's nothing else to say. All right. Uh, number 34. If we are all waiting for judgment day, in order to determine our fate to go to heaven or hell, where do we go to if we die now? Is there another place? Um, yes. I, I would like to tweak something in the question itself, just to make sure, Yanni, we're saying things uh, correctly. The premise of the question is based on a little bit of an inaccuracy. Inaccuracy. We are not waiting on judgment day to determine our fate, if we go to heaven or hell. We are waiting on judgment day to be placed in our final destination. But the fate itself is known or determined by when we go to that other place. And um, as you called it, the other place, and which is either Hades, God forbid, or hopefully for all of us, that will be paradise. Okay? So the waiting places are paradise or Hades. And once you are in Hades or in paradise, you know where you go. So you know your fate then. It's just waiting until you are placed there. It's kind of like, um, so if, if you know anything about me, I, I, I came to go to Texas A&M in College Station in the mid-80s, and I lived there for... 26 years until I became a priest about uh, six and a half years ago. And it has an airport, but it's a tiny, tiny, tiny airport. Okay. So this is where I got this idea. It's kind of like, so this, this question, Ian, it's kind of like an airport with only two gates and has two airplanes. Okay. Parked at those two gates. If you look at the monitors, there'll be row one and row two. That's it. Flight, this flight or that flight. One flight is going to uh, California and the other flight is going to New York, okay? And you don't know which flight you will be on, but once you get to the airport, they tell you, wait at terminal one or wait at terminal two. And you can see on the, on the screen like where it's going, right? So then you know your final destination. You know... Uh, by then, if you are going to California or if you're going to New York. Now, Judgment Day, the day when you're actually placed in there, is simply when the planes like off and like land in their destinations. Okay? But you already know before you are placed there. Um, side note, I want to say here regarding salvation and do we know where we're going to be and stuff like that. If someone, and actually, you know what? I'm going to ask you guys a question now, and I hope you will. And let me pull up the grid so I can maybe see y'all. If someone on your campus, a neighbor, a friend, or whatever, or somebody at church asks you, um, 
are you going to heaven or hell? What what would you answer? <laughs> like, it's based on our actions, right? Like, even if we're baptized, but we live an ungodly life, would we still go to hell? Yeah. So what would your answer? Heaven, hell, or I don't know, or what? It depends on the sins of the day. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Okay, uh, Helena, Helena is saying Christ died for us, so he already paid the debt for us to go to heaven. That is correct, but not, not all people go, right? Many are called, few are chosen. Um, and we are ready from reading Revelation that some, or Matthew 25, that some will be on his right and they will go to the kingdom prepared for them before the foundation of the world, and some will be on his left, and they will go to the Levirah, which is prepared for the devil and his demons. So here's here's um, what what, what I, I okay I'll say it this way I don't want you to ever I don't want to ever hear any of you saying I don't know or I have no clue okay God is not playing games with us He told us clearly if you make these certain choices and live your life this certain way you will make it. So the answer to that question should be the answer to the question, hey, are you living your life to the best of your ability according to God's will, the guidance of your father confession, kaza, kaza, kaza? Are you building a genuine, real relationship with him? Are you trying to follow his commandments that he uh, told you? Are you trying really hard with actions, not feelings, to live your life like God wants you to live? Um, uh, do you go to father confession or spiritual guide and work out things together? If the answer to that is yes, then the answer to the first question is yes. By God's grace, yes. Okay. Uh, I don't want you to doubt that or not know. Um, okay. Using the analogy of the airport and the terminal, you know, the plane and stuff like that that I just mentioned. <clears throat> Excuse me. If God gave you a ticket for one of those airplanes, <clears throat> uh, no, God would give you a, a ticket for the plane that he wants you to get on, okay? Not going to to what state. And he said, come to the airport at this day and at this time and bring your ID and make sure you bring your ticket, this ticket with you. And give you some instructions of, of what to do when you get to the airport or how to get to the airport, okay? And someone asks you, Hey, will you make it to New York, for example? The answer should be, yeah, because I, I trust God. Now, I'm not being arrogant. I don't deserve a ticket, okay? I didn't buy this ticket. I didn't pay for this ticket. I can't afford this ticket. But God bought it. And he told me, if you bring this ticket with you and your ID, the ID could be like your baptism. Um, and then those this, the stuff that you need to bring with you, that would be like your the way you lived your life, okay, according to his, his commandments and his will. If you do this, you will make it to New York. So the answer should be yes. I don't deserve it. I didn't pay for it. But God did it, and he, he told me to bring it with me. Then, yeah, I'm going to New York. God is not playing games with us, okay? St. Paul talks to us, if you read his epistles, about the hope of the assurance of our salvation. Hope of the assurance of our salvation. We kind of need to have that, that excited expectation that if I, it, okay, the million dollar question here, the gajillion dollar question here is that a person be honest with themselves, right? Um, and that's why we need the guidance. That's why we need the church. That's why we need the confession. They're not going to get us to heaven, okay? But they're just to make sure to help me. I'm not fooling myself because the heart is deceitful. But, um, this way, uh, yani how, how I would answer. But the waiting places would be paradise or Hades. You all see the screen, right? I want to make sure you're seeing the questions too. All right. Number 35. 
what are some good apologetic books to read? Um, cool. Uh, I just mentioned three here. Uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Brilliant author, very heady, and uh, it'd be a good book for people who are like extremely smart um, and they like have an answer for everything because he uses logic. Um, I, th I think I talked about C.S. Lewis in, in the book recommendation questions in the previous time. Um, On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. It's a book. It's very good. Um, one that is good and kind of modern for our days is uh, Timeless Truths for Truthless Times by George Vassilius. Um, he lives in, in San Francisco, I believe, and, and he wrote this book recently, just a couple years ago, a few years ago. Timeless Truths for Truthless Times. Uh, all these will be on Amazon and, and everywhere. Number 36. How to overcome a sin you are addicted to. I think uh, we need a whole meeting for this one by itself. But I'll try to take a shot at some steps. Number one, prayer. Yeah, yeah, prayer, Sunday school, lesson. It's, you hear it a million times because this is the first key, okay? Pray for God to help you with it. But know this, if you pray and you don't work at it, God won't do diddly. God is not an enabler. You got to do your part. God will never do for you what you do for yourself. And I, I think that also if you try very hard and you don't pray, then you don't have a very good chance either. So number one is pray. Pray for God to help you, but be sure that you got to do your part. Your part. Number two, instead of trying to fight the addiction itself, look for the triggers. Um, what do I mean? A lot of times when we focus on fighting the sin itself, which can be very hard, especially if you're addicted to it. But we were the triggers. Um, let's say, for example, watching inappropriate stuff online. Okay. Now, once the temp let's say that's the, the sin that I'm addicted to. Now, once the temptation comes to do that, it's very hard to resist. That's why it's a $30 billion industry. Um, but People keep paying you know, to, to, to keep watching. So I would ask myself, what are the triggers that led me to this point where I was faced with the temptation? Um, is it when I'm stressed or anxious? Is it, and I'm trying to like, uh, see some sort of re relief or release. Is it when I have too much time on my hands, which is actually, I think, the most common one? Um, is it when I watch movies with love scenes or listen to songs that talk about inappropriate lyrics? Is it when I hang out with those specific friends? Is it uh, when I don't sleep well? Is it when I'm trying to fall asleep, but I fall asleep? You know, I think it's important to try to find out what are the triggers? What are the conditions that are surrounding me at the times that I have fallen into this thing? Just go back and try to picture it. And I think it'll, it'll tell you how to begin this fight in a good way. Now, after you determine triggers, go and work on fighting or resisting or correcting those triggers themselves, not the addiction. For example, use an example I mentioned earlier, figure out a, a, a good, healthy de-stressors like exercise or prayer or calling a good friend or uh, in order to avoid, this is, you know, when you're stressed or, um, if the problem is that you have too much time on your hand, make a schedule for yourself and like, uh, don't let there be any idle time. Fill the schedule for every day. With stuff. Um, even if like the schedule doesn't have to be all spiritual or work or study, like the schedule can have things like watch a show, take a nap, eat. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be all all that like. Like a, a schedule for a convention or a retreat. If you look at it, we do a ton of stuff in just three or four days <clears throat> or just a weekend. And why? It's because we pick a schedule and we stick with it. Um, and the schedule has sleep time, eat time, time, you know, fun time. 
along with lectures, Bible studies, Q and A's, workshops, meetings, whatever. Um, if it is or, or entertainment or songs, avoid them. You know, avoid that. You can avoid. You can find an alternative uh, for them. Um, if it's uh, have when you're in a hard time to fall to, to go to sleep, go to bed after a little bit of prayer, asking God to watch over you, help you. And when you go to take a sermon or a good book with the bed. Um, so and this is using uh, this example of maybe watching, being addicted to watching appropriate stuff online. But the message here is instead of focus on fighting the addiction to temptation, is to find the triggers that lead you to doing that. If it's an addiction to you know, walking pot or doing some sort of whatever, maybe somebody says it's, it's when I have exams or it's uh, when uh, my parents yell at me and put me down or it's whatever. Find the church and, and work on resisting those, solving those, treating those, dealing with those. And then the temptation itself will be actually something you won't have to face because you're taking care of the trick themselves that lead to the temptation. Now, this will be the hardest at first, okay? But then if you stick with this, it will get easier and easier over time. And if you've done all that and it's not working, you'll need help, counseling or a bona and so on. Um, there's an awesome study did out there um, one of the things that I really love is the brain and how it works, although I understand that very minimal about it. Um, they did this really cool study. And so they said, okay, if, if there's an animal in the forest, all right, a, a bear or a deer or something, this animal wants to cross the forest for the first time, they're going to walk, and there's like grass and stuff, so they walk on it. What's going to happen to that grass? it kind of gets pressed down. It kind of gets matted down. Okay? And chances are at the end of the day when this bear or deer or whatever is going back to their den or their home or, or where they were or they came from, um, chances are which path are they going to take? They're going to take that same path again. Okay, And they will keep repeating this every day. Whenever they want to cross the forest, they're going to take that path. And eventually it becomes literally a beaten path. Like that, there's, there will be no grass there. It'll be like kind of like just dirt. And it'll be the path that this animal takes. It'll be whenever an other animal want to cross, they'll take that path because it's the path of least resistance. So they said, they discovered that this actually is etching a trail. It actually happens in the brain. Um, just like the trails in the forest. Every time you think a thought, this is like the first pass. If you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, it becomes like half a place resistant. Your brain naturally goes to it. Uh, you probably kind of experienced that, how like maybe in a hymns class, like sometimes the, the, the instructor tries to get in from the minutes. Like it's hard. I, I have to go back to that path and like begin it. And then I know what tune I'm at. Or some is when you when you chant a hymn and it sounds like uh, another hymn, like, and you know we have a few of those, right? Like it's kind of there's cr crisscrossing here, and like you kind of unintentionally go from this path to that path, and like how did I end this hymn? Um, some of you know what I'm talking about, if you me. So, and and it's just like the forest. If I force myself every time I get thought, and then I think a different thought. I'm making a new route, okay, like a bypass, a different direction. It's going to be the hardest at first. But if stick with it, just take it, say if you feel something, like the same, the same time, same place, like for 21 days in a row, it becomes a habit. Okay. So it's going to be hard at first, but then go will be a new path. And then guess what? The old trail that you have been using because you stopped using it so much, the grass and the shrubs will grow back up and you won't be walking on it. Um, it's kind of like, let's say another example, other than marching porn or whatever. Let's say uh, you tend to be very cynical and very mental of people. If you make yourself the exercise that every time you get a negative thought about one, I will turn it into a positive prayer or something marvelous to happen to them. Okay? So you're resisting that one with a different path. Over time, it will become second nature to you. 
as soon as a thought maybe tries to begin being negative about a person, you will pray for it. And maybe over time, you'll just, everybody you meet, you just pray something beautiful for them in spirit and then think about the judgmental thing. So I, th I think that's pretty awesome to see how that works. Um, I heard about just recently about a good sermon by His Grace Bishop Yusuf called The Sin Cycle or The Cycle of Sin um, related to this. And I think, yeah, and you should check it out. It's probably on uh, His Grace's SoundCloud or, or something like that. So um, I'll move on to the next question. 37. Still have about 20 minutes. Why did the angels rebel against God since heaven is full of peace and love and God is the most perfect and most loving? Good question. Can you please give a brief history of this event? Thank you, Amina. Please pray for me. Um, okay. Uh, how can this happen? What caused this? Pride. Pride, arrogance. Um, taking credit for what God has given, okay, and comparing and being discontent with what God gave. So pride and arrogance, taking credit for what God has given, comparing, being discontent with what God gave. This is what led Satan and the demons that joined him to while being in the presence of God before the creation and everything. Okay, Satan was, uh, this is the history of it, Satan was a glorious archangel, okay, like morning star. He was like right up there with Archangel, okay. And he was like the number two man, if you will, and excuse the terminology. So he was so gorgeous and so powerful and so beautiful and all that stuff that it got to him. And out of his own will, uh, he decided to rebel against God. It's in Isaiah 14. And um, by the way, angels have free will. Okay. God gave them free will to choose him or to not choose him. Well, obviously, right? Because he didn't create them as demons or as devils. He created them all as, as good angels. Um, and so he did to sit on God's throne. And because he is cunning serpent, he was able to fool or convince one third of the angels to uh, uh, got them to join him, to follow his cause, okay? And there was a great big war between Archangel Michael and the good angels and Satan, the bad angels or demons. And of course they lost, thank God. Um, yes, heaven is full of peace and joy and love, but this actually proves to us that circumstances do not determine our choices. Circumstances do not determine our choices. Circumstances do not determine our destiny. One person could be in heaven on earth and choose poorly and live poorly. And one person could be living in on earth and choose wisely, live wisely. And we probably all of us know examples of both. Um, angels, this is the last I'll say about this one. Angels will not repent. Okay, the angels rebelled, will not repent. Because angels are above time. They were created before earth, before the time that we know, that we live on. Okay, they already made their decision. There is no late or earlier or sooner. It's, it's hard to explain is what it is. It's like, it's, there's no time up there. So it's like, like a, an instant, if you will, or a picture or a snapshot. Um, they already made their decision, so there's no later or earlier and past or future in the spiritual realm. They chose poorly, halas. It's a done deal for them. They made their choice. Um, okay, let's move on. 38, I think we have 41 or 42 questions, so I'll try to hurry so we can uh, finish this. I know that evangelism is an important part of being a Christian. Absolutely. Because Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the creation. Despite this, I am uncomfortable evangelizing because it is essentially like religious marketing. For example, befriending someone who is not religious in hopes to get them interested or 
con to convert to Christianity uh, isn't really a true friendship because there is ulterior motives here. How do I deal with this, with these feelings? What practical ways would you advise us to evangelize? I love this person and I love the honesty of this person, how they're trying to hold it. So the answer is yes, but there's a huge difference. It is marketing. Yeah. There is a huge difference between evangelism and marketing, which is the marketing you're talking about is always for the marketer's benefit, uh, for the benefit of the business, for the benefit of the salesperson, right? Evangelism is marketing, but it's marketing for whose benefit? It's for the benefit of the recipient, the customer, the, the person, the proselyte, the person you're trying to, not proselyte, that's not right, the person you're trying to make a believer. If evangelism is actually very selfless because it focuses on two others and not the self. Can you tell who the two others are? God and neighbor. Isn't that awesome? Evangelism fulfills the two greatest commands. The act of evangelism. Because God delights from this, and he, he said that he desires that all are saved come to the knowledge of the truth. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, this is his wish, his desire, his hope. Okay? So when you do this, you're, you're giving him a gift that he wants, that he wishes for. Okay? And it's the ultimate example of loving your neighbor as yourself because this is the best thing you could do for them to introduce them to God and make them fall in love with God and help them to begin a relationship with God, okay? We are created for two reasons, to know him and to make him known. The best thing I can do for myself is to know God. To love neighbor as myself is to help my neighbor know God. That's, that's it. So, on to the next part. Practical steps to visualize. Um, uh, this one actually is another, not just another, actually we gave a whole 20 hour course seminary on evangelism and all this stuff, but I'll, I'll give it a shot to just try to take a few steps to begin with. Number one, this may be surprised to you, work on being the best Christian that you can be at any given point in time. Wait, I'm talking about evangelism, the other time, other people, whatever, yeah. Before you get there, we're being the best Christian you can be. The best Christian you can be now. Walk with God. Okay? Be faithful to what God entrusted you with now. This is the first step. And before you go, well, I'm not really a very good Christian, so I'm going to stop. Nice try. That's not going to cut it. Okay? Listen to the end. So that's number one. Number two, let your Christianity show. Some people are consumed or confused by this because they say, wait a minute, shouldn't like I pray in secret and give in secret, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing kind of a thing. Yes, but at commandment, that order is when dealing with other believers. But when it comes to unbelief that you are trying to evangelize or to when it comes to your own children, when you have kids that you're trying to ch Okay, and also that you're also trying to evangelize. You're trying to evangelize your children. This is one of the duties of parents, by the way. Actually, the duty of parents. It's not to educate and get them married and get them rich and fat and all that stuff. It is to evangelize the children. Okay? Um, so show them this Christianity. You don't have to tell them that, uh, you know, I gave X dollars or I praised prayer or that hour or I fasted or abstained this long. It's too much detail. And yeah, you shouldn't be doing that because that's not good motives. You should tell them that you do give. You should let them know that you do pray, that you do fast, that you do serve, that you do, that you do volunteer. And the reasons for why you do those things. The reasons why you are the person that you are. Number three. So we said, be as Christian. Let that Christianity show. Let them know it. Number three. They need to see that you are different, that you're not like everybody out there, okay? That you, there's something kind of in a, like weird about you in a good way. First Peter 3.15 says, 
but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready. You hear those words? Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with me and fear. Don't be cocky and arrogant and haughty. Do it with meekness and fear. But always be ready to give a reason for the hope that they see in you. So if they could ask you about this hope, this means to think. Number one, they saw that. They saw that hope in you. They saw that you're a person who's usually hope and, and positive and upbeat and at peace and you're not freaking out. And you don't gossip and judge and partake of kind of stuff like that, which supports point number two, that you are showing Christianity. Okay, number two in that section is that not only they saw it, but they need to have seen it so much and they need to have seen that you are so different, like that you have peace when everybody else is freaking out, that you love when people are being unlovely, that you don't pose or wear a mask or when everybody else is doing it, that you're doing this so consistently that it gets their attention. It's not just they noticed, noticed it one time, oh yeah, that guy's pretty cool. Yeah, like him. No, they need to see you do this consistently to the point where, like, what is with you? Why are you smiling? They're, they're doing layoffs in the company. Why aren't you freaking out? Like, why, why are you all that stuff? Um, so, you need to show them, like, you need to be in the world, which supports the previous ones. Number four, it's always time to evangelize. You know, Ecclesiastes says, there's a time to talk and a time to be silent, time to speak and a time to be quiet. That's true it's in the Bible. But it is always time to evangelize. You can evangelize by your speaking and you can evangelize by your silence, by simply by how you behave, by your word choices. Um, 2 Timothy 4.2 is preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. It's either in season or out of season, right? It's either football season or it's a football season. There's no other times, which means, so this means what? Always, again. Be ready, uh, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. In season and out of season means all the time. Number five, lastly, for now, for this question. Don't receive the lies of the devil about that you being not ready to do this. Okay, remember the, the person who would think, well, I'm not like a perfect Christian, so I'm not going to do it. No, don't receive that. You'll never be a perfect Christian, but you are striving to be one. You're, you're on your way, okay? Don't believe the lies of the devil that you are not ready for this and you can't do this, that you don't know enough, that you're too much of a sinner to do it, etc. Um, this is what he wants because he wants you to not evangelize because he wants less people to know God and to fall in love with him. A great example of this is who? John 4, the Samaritan woman. She wasn't a scholar. She didn't spend years with God. She just began a relationship with him, a conversation with him. And she has been living in sin for years with many men. And she's even like became desensitized to sin because the last man she was with, well, she wouldn't even bother marrying. We don't even have to make it official. Those, yeah, I don't care. Yalla, come on in. Yeah. But she went out and evangelized and brought the entire city of Sihar in Samaria. And they all believed. Right? Um, what you need to do, this is huge. Okay? What you need to do is tell them your own personal experience and your own personal knowledge of God. Tell them who God is to you in your own words. So let's say the person asked this question, uh, her name is Jennifer. So there's the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Jennifer. Okay, you, you be that first gospel. You know when, when the Lord asked the apostles, who do people say that I am? And then Elijah, John, you're one of the prophets. And then he said, well, he didn't stop there. He said, well, who, what do you say I am? It's very important to me to know that you know who I am to you. And this supports the, the, the early part is that 
What is your Christianity? Is it just some practices or like do you know who God is to you? Can you sit there and describe to God how sweet he is? No, I'm sorry, not describe to God. Describe God to a person or a friend. Can you sit there and talk about what God is to you, who he is in your life? You know, imagine if 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 you tell a friend, you know, um, uh, there's this great dish at this restaurant, okay? And they'll say, oh, no way, describe it to me. And you go, well, I, I think it's, I don't know, like maybe kind of salty, sweet and sour. Like if you haven't tried it, if you haven't tasted it, if you haven't eaten it yourself, it's going to be very difficult, awkward, and it will be very poor marketing. You're not going to, using the terminology of the question, you're not going to be able to sell it. Okay, so you got to taste God for yourself and then just let the words flow. Don't worry about how you do it or like you said to the apostle, don't worry about the words you say, the Holy Spirit will give that to you. But you have to have him in you. You have to have tasted him so that you can be able to talk about it. All right, number 39. <laughs> Again, feel free to jump in and interrupt me anytime if you need to. What is the simplest way? Ooh to explain Christianity to others and show them why they should care. This question may seem simple, but it's actually very complicated, I think. Um, I don't think there's a magic bullet or like one answer for this. The simplest way to explain Christianity to others and show them why they should care. I think the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on who you're talking to. I think the simplest way is to apply it to something tangible in that person's life, the person you're talking to. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ did this, like when he was talking with fishermen, he used, like he talked about fish and fishing and nets and so on. Um, when he was talking to farmers, he would talk about like farming analogies, the, the sower, the seed, the soil, and so on. Okay. I think that would be the simplest way. Um, uh, yeah, and if, if you really want me to tell you something, if you really want me to tell you something, I would say, yeah, use the analogy of parents with kids because we all were kids and we all have or had parents. Okay, so I think everybody can maybe relate to this. That's what I mean by, by simple, like make it analogous and something people can relate to. I would say, imagine, Masalan Yani, I would say, imagine every rule or commandment that your parents gave you. Eat your veggies, don't stay up too late, wash behind your ears, um, don't hang out with bad friends, do your homework, study hard, etc. All the rules and the commandments they gave you are for whose benefit? They are all for your benefit. All of them. Every one of them. Okay? They're not trying to control you, limit you, uh, stop your freedom, make your life miserable or hard. None of that. Now, what they're telling you to do may be hard work, you know, maybe not always pleasant, but they do this out of their love for you and their delight is to see you heed those instructions because if you do you will have the best life you could possibly have um i'll tell you um Okay, I'll tell you, like, you know, using analogies and parents and kids and stuff like that. I like to tell that story, especially when I'm talking with a person who, believe it or not, Yanni, believer or not, not believe it or not, uh, who's going through a very difficult time and they don't understand why they're going through that. I was actually talking about this with, with a friend today. So when, you know, when, when, when people are babies, you have to, uh, they have to get like so many shots of immunizations, vaccines, like in the first two years of their life. Okay. Like three months, six months, nine, 12, 18, 24, something like that. <clears throat> and I'll never forget this. When, when I have three kids, you probably know some of them or some of you may know them, but um, 
they're old now. They're 25, 21, and 18. When they about, I remember this more when they're six months because, you know, when babies are six months, they're starting to get those two little teeth down there and, like, they smell anything that moves and, like, they're just, or, you know, just perfect. And I remember going to the pediatrician's office and you go into to after the waiting room, you go into the room where the examinations occur and the vaccinations will be given and so on. And you walk in the room and you're carrying the baby and they're looking at the wall and there's like butterflies and bunny rabbits and little birdies and like, you know, cute, fun colors. And they're like, oh, I'm enjoying this. And then this nurse walks in. I'm not exaggerating. Maybe it was just coincidence. The nurse in that office, she looked like she was an Olympic lifter, man. Like she was very muscular. And she would say, lay him down. I'm like, yes, ma'am. And so I would, you know, grab the baby and lay him down on the bed, the hospital bed, you know, that, that the patient bed or whatever you call it. And she brings her like two or three syringes and she's holding them down. I was like, yes, ma'am. And I was scared of her. But anyway, um, so they don't give the shots arm because baby's arms are too small. So they do it in the thigh. So she, she would pass the pods, the front thigh of the baby, not give the syringe like like you would think a person would give a syringe like this no would hold it like she's throwing a dart and she squeeze the thigh and go like that quick quick fast squeeze and pull it out and babies when they feel pain when they're that little they have this little delay it's like one second or two seconds so i'm holding the baby and they're looking like you know, like there's this moment of like, what just happened? Oh, I hate this. Ah. Now here's the kicker part that helps me relate to things and to understand things. The look on their eye, I will never forget this. Looking at my face and going, why are you allowing this to happen to me? This hurts. I hate this. I've never experienced such pain in my whole life. All six months of them. Why are you doing it? Not only are you allowing that you are helping her, you, you are participating in causing this pain. And all my thoughts, this look of confusion and like betrayal, like my father is betraying me. I thought you were my father, you know. Of course, this is all just, I'm reading their facial expressions, okay, their, their eyes and stuff. And all I'm thinking is like, I wish I could communicate with you. I wish I could just express to you that what I'm doing right now, I know it hurts to Habibi. I know. I don't, I hate to see you hurt, but what I'm doing now is so good for you. What I'm doing right now is a few instances of pain to help you avoid decades of years of pain. Okay. And so sometimes we don't understand, but, but we, we look at this and we remember, you know what? You know, I don't understand what's going on, but like, just like how humans do it with their babies, I don't have to understand, you know, what God is allowing in my life. This is, could be like to avoid eternity of pain because life on earth to eternity is a snap of a finger if you live for a hundred years. Anyway, I don't want to mumble too much, but just this question is, it's very broad and, and very, I think the simplest way is simply just give them relatable life analogies from wherever they are in their life. You talk to the student, you talk about professors and classes and exams and, you know, think of ways to relate that. If you're talking to a chef, talk about food and fruits and vegetables and meat and uh, cooking, I don't know. Um, that kind of, number 40, oops, uh, number 40. I know we're, we're, we hit our time mark, but I want to answer the last couple of questions so that we can, uh, just wrap it up. If we assume there is a good atheist, I'm going to read it from here. This is bigger. If we assume there's a good atheist and a good Christian who both have good works, why should the Christian go to heaven while the atheist is to hell? I have heard one atheist ask this question and say, so Christians can sin, but as long as they are foolish enough to believe in a God that they are buddies with, that they're redeemed and go to heaven? One argument he heard was that God doesn't force people into his presence, but he argues that one can safely assume that babies who die prematurely end up in heaven. Good argument. Although without their choice, he concluded 
that perhaps choosing God is not a prerequisite for heaven, just like those who led a good life without hearing the gospel, but will likely go to heaven. Eh. He adds that if believing is a prerequisite for salvation, then it is silly, a silly worldview. How would you respond to such an atheist? You're asking big questions. Um, okay. The premises of this question is full of mistakes and misunderstandings. Um, we have to like correct those first. Okay, number one. We don't go to heaven by our works or good deeds. It is an invitation from God. So yeah, he's right there. If, if going to heaven was by good works, um, then the atheist and the Christian who have good works and they would get in, but it's not. It's not by good works. It's just that the good works are an indication of the true faith that we can, we can talk about that later, the true faith. I love the quote that uh, His Holiness Pope Shenouda the third said. Uh, he said, we don't go to heaven by our works, but we cannot go to heaven without our works. We don't go to heaven by our works. You can't earn your way into heaven, but you won't get into heaven without your works. Number two. The other part about babies is so wrong. It is actually stupid. Excuse me. Yeah, and forgive me, but, but it is. Let me, let me tell you why. This is like saying that heaven or hell is like having milk or juice with your dinner. Like both are equally okay choices. And of course they are not. Um, it's like saying that if a father or a parent decide, here we go with the analogies, right? It's like saying the father or a parent decide to let their kids choose what's good for them or let their kids choose uh, like to go to college or not is forcing them to do so by taking them to kindergarten and school because they didn't get the kids permission first to let them choose. But Yanni, it is likely saying that they forced, it's like they're saying, this person is saying they forced to feed the kids with food, even though the kids didn't explicitly say, please feed me, I choose food. Okay, the parents are doing what's best for them. So number three, uh, also the babies thing, uh, it, it takes out the God, that God is omnipotent, okay? God, um, I'm sorry, omniscient, not omnipotent, omnipotent is all powerful, omniscient, all knowing. God knows uh, this baby would live, would, how they would have lived their life if they were to live it up to through adulthood, okay? So if he decides to let this baby person in heaven, he's forcing them into heaven? No. He didn't get there okay first. Now, people who did live a full life before they died, they end up in a higher rank, okay, a higher glory in heaven because they went through the tests and trials of life and they fought and they conquered and they finished the race. While they be God in, yeah, but uh, because they didn't commit sin, one is active going in and one is passive going in. So they would be rewarded more, appreciated more, granted more. Number four. Again, those who led a good life without hearing the gospel, he's assuming here that one goes to heaven only by good works, which is a wrong premise. I think I mentioned that earlier. Number five, um, about the, the, the silly world, world view thing. I really don't get atheists. Um, a lot of them don't just believe in God don't just not believe in God. They make it their mission to try to destroy his reputation, which is nonsensical or, or in like in a schizophrenic way, because how can you destroy the reputation of someone who doesn't exist that you don't care about? It cracks me up, Yanni, how atheists think with, with silly or naive, that we are silly or naive because we believe in God, but it's not silly for them to believe that life just happened out of thin air and like creation happened out of thin air. Um, 
I meet with and talk with a lot of atheists, uh, especially since the priesthood, mainly because I travel a lot and they're quickly attracted, you know, to, to my looks and they say, okay, target, you know, let's, they come and they try to pick a fight um, to like have a go, you know, but I found out that out of, I would say tens, dozens, uh, only two of them were atheists because they were born in an atheist family. And their parents were convinced, convinced them of this and they grew up believing this. And actually, they didn't have like all these anger issues and they kind of didn't care. Um, but all of the rest, my brethren, all of the rest, um, they're just mad at God or they hated God. They decided, you know what, you don't exist anymore. They were at one point in time believers. Uh, they were born in a believing family or something like that. And they went to church. Uh, and all that stuff, but something very hurtful, very disappointing happened to them. Uh, they prayed hard, but mom and dad got divorced anyway. They prayed hard, but grandma or Fluffy the cat died anyway. Um, or, this is a big one, they saw someone they highly esteemed who was a servant or clergy or somebody who professed their Christianity big time, okay? do something royally bad and royally wrong, okay? And then they were devastated and they, they decided, I, I don't worship that God if, if such people who are so-called godly Christians do the, such bad things. That's why I said early, don't just say you're Christian, live out your Christianity and show it to them. Also, the world and schools and universities are trying to convince others that there is no God with evolution and and other hypothetical philosophical garbage, like macroevolution, not microevolution. Um, and so they believe these lies. Um, but somehow, you know, let's, let's talk evolution. Like there's no archeological evidence of the transitional species, for example. <clears throat> and somehow the, the, like, as these species were evolving, sexual organs of both males and females would have to evolve at the same rate, at the same time, but in opposite compelled ways to still be able to procreate. And, and some of those creatures changed from, say, amoeba to fish, but some decided, no, we're going to stay amoeba. We like our life as amoeba. We're going to stay amoeba. And then some remained fish, but some changed from to mammals. And then some remain, then some change to birds or either. You know, like that somehow God doesn't exist, but all the order and the organization, this the very fragile balance of life on earth to be permitted is happenstance. You know that if the earth on just a little bit slower or a little bit faster, it'd be disaster. Or if the distance from the sun was a little bit off, we disaster closer or farther, would either burn up or freeze. It wouldn't last life. They're just the rate of spinning, the, the power of gravity, the mass, the 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 the, the balance of everything. Just it has to be perfect in order for life to work on Earth. How can they think this is happenstance? If they refuse the, the mathematical statistics that I mentioned earlier, a book written thousands and hundreds of years before this person came, and this person satisfied, you know, all these prophecies. How, how can you, like, truly it takes more faith to be an atheist than to be a Christian. You have to believe in all kinds of stuff that you haven't seen or can't have an answer for to be an atheist than to be a Christian. The last thing I'll say about this is, is this, as St. Paul advises, do not engage in useless arguments, foolish, useless arguments. If someone just wants to debate and poke holes, don't waste your time with them. They're, they're, not, they're not ready yet. Abuna, you said evangelize all the time. Yeah, but it's not evangelism. Okay, this is a person who just wants to fight. They're not going to be listening to you or anything. Okay, now if some, I mean, still be ready. Read the apologetic books so that you're able to answer such questions, okay? But if someone is indeed questioning, sincerely asking and seeking the truth, by all means, focus on them 
and spend lots of time with them and energy answering them and answer the questions. And if you don't know the answer, tell them, you know what, that's a great question. I don't know. I'm going to find the answers and let's get back together again uh, for another coffee date and I'll get you the, the, the answers or something like that. And this way you arranged for another follow up time. You know, that's good marketing. You know, you want to, the customer, you want to keep their attention so that you can help them for their benefit. I don't want to call evangelism marketing. Okay, two more questions, I think. 41. What does it actually mean to be orthodox versus non orthodox? Not really sure what this person is asking here exactly, but, but I guess I'll take a shot at it. Uh, orthodox versus non-orthodox. First of all, I want to clarify that orthodoxy is not a denomination. Orthodoxy is not a denomination. Orthodoxy is pre-denominational Christianity. Orthodoxy is pre-denominational Christianity. Orthodoxy is the original Christianity handed down from our Lord Jesus Christ to the believers um, uh, and has the, the believers have been sticking to that since the first century. Hence the term orthodoxy. Ortho means like orthodontics or orthopedics, and doxy from like doxology, okay, like faith or opinion. So it's the straight faith. We're not going to touch to the left or to the right. But imagine if it's just a little bit off over centuries and centuries, you end up going out in left field. We leave, it is the fullness of the faith, the wholeness of the faith as handed to us from our Lord Jesus Christ through the apostles, the church fathers down to us. Other Christians are indeed Christians, absolutely Christians, and they love God and try to live according to God. No problems there. Yani, I, I admire a lot of them. I wish I was yani, as faithful as some of them. Okay? But they do not have the fullness of the faith. Oops, where did I go? To be orthodox simply means that the person, number one, uh, accepts the orthodox faith and beliefs teachings. The person has been baptized as orthodox in an orthodox church, whether as a baby or as an adult. Number three, that the person lives their everyday life according to the Christian Orthodox faith and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, headed down to the apostles, to the church fathers, down the centuries all the way to us today, and lives their everyday life like this with all their, with all that entails, with all their intentions, okay? Whether practicing the sacraments, daily seeking to become more and more Christ-like every day, um, gives, serves, loves their enemies, all the teachings of the Bible. And this, on, this person is honest to their faith no matter where they are, even if alone at home or uh, nobody else is them. Okay? Because a person can be orthodox in front of public, but when they're alone, they're not orthodox at all, or maybe not even Christian at all. I guess I'll sum it up this way. You are orthodox if you have the same faith that all Christians, listen to this, that all Christians in the entire known world had an agreed, in the entire world, sorry, that had an agreed upon for the first at least 500 years, actually for the first thousand years, since we didn't have any start having any new denominations until about 1050 or um, when the first denomination broke off. For that, pretty much all Christian Christian belief was the same belief, and it still is the same belief to today. Okay. Um, even though I'll say this, even though rites and traditions were acted by the cultures. Okay, every country that is an Orthodox church they, they, is the same faith. The way they do it may be a little bit different, but that's not the faith, the dogma, the doctrine. Uh, as I said earlier, Orthodoxy is pre-denominational. So if you believe and live 
like what Oxenden believed in the entire first 10 centuries, you are orthodox. Okay? If you believe and practice, if what you believe and practice has veered a little bit off from that, what all Christians in the entire world believed for the first 10 centuries, uh, or even part of it, then you are not orthodox anymore. Um, I'm not sure if I really answered this question well, but I guess I'll, I'll ask you all if, if you have more questions, you need to please try to be more detailed or as clear as possible so I can better answer. All right, number 42. This question came in like just now, actually like I saw it immediately before the, the talk. Uh, I think that person just sent it recently, but I'll, I'll try to do it real quick because it's a very, very important question. Um, regarding the topic of self-love, many compare themselves to others and society dictates earthly rules that are followed even without full knowledge of doing so. I agree. It's like subliminal brainwashing. Many all have tribulations in their past and continues to affect them today. So my question is this, what do you believe would be the first step in healing from childhood trauma, self-hate and emotional exhaustion that continues to affect daily life of many kids, both in church and in school? Okay. Uh, this requires a lot more info and uh, probably a one-on-one -on -one conversation to get like all kinds of background and uh, yeah, I need to see exactly what this person is dealing with and what type of wounds and stuff like that because it's not all like th there's like not one general answer to fit all. Okay. Um. So they said in the like second line, they said comparing themselves to other. Yeah, comparing is a lose-lose situation. Okay, when you compare with anybody, actually that was Satan's beginning of his end, right, of his demise. He compared himself with God. He said, well, he's up there. I'm not on his throne. I want to be on throne. Comparing is a lose-lose situation because either nobody is exactly like you, okay, and God did that by design. Okay, they will be better than you in some things and you will be better than them in some other things. Although you, when you do the comparison, you're comparing with things that you, you have self-doubts in or that you are, you know, you feel like you're lacking in and believe it or not, you will compare yourself with people who do it really well. So you'll usually like feel really bad and depressed. So, but either way, just look at it from a mathematical way. Like if, if I compare myself with somebody and found out that they are better than me in that thing, I will get depressed, discouraged, despair. I feel even worse about myself, confident, and so on. And if I find out that I am better than them, I will very likely get arrogant or prideful or haughty and so on. So just co don't compare because it's a lose-lose situation. But to answer this question real quick, and I know I'm not going to do it justice. Number one, counseling. Um, of it, a person with so many wounds and trauma and whatnot needs counseling. Um, number two, bring it up uh, in confession. Even if, it, it, like, if you did not do it and it was done to you, I'm not saying confess it because you sinned, you did this. No, even if this something that was done to you, a trauma done to you, an abuse done to you, Bringing it up in confession brings God to work on it, brings God into the equation. And then God and Abuna can, like, Abuna also can lift you up on the altar and pray, which is extremely powerful. I've seen many miracles, really. Uh, one of the things I love about being a priest is that I get to pray for people, serve praise on the altar, and then see them come to fruition. It's pretty awesome. Um, so culling, bringing it up in confession to shed light on it so the great physician can begin to heal. Um, remind yourself that even if you participated in this trauma and this abuse as a child, you are still a victim of what happened to you. 
Yani I, I, I bet this person feels angry at themselves or they feel like they are guilty, which actually I think they said self-hate in there or self-loathing. Um, number four, remind yourself that society, media of all kinds, including social media, of course, <clears throat> especially social media. Um, social media is like the comparison station. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much that happens there, but uh, and all kinds of media, TV, movies, billboards that you see in, in the highways you're driving or the road you're driving. All these are part of the world. And as we know, the prince of this world is trying to destroy you. Roaming about like a wrong lion, seeking whom he may devour. Okay? So don't buy the lie. It's funny to me how, how people, so many people, so readily accept the lies of the world. And so readily reject the truths of God and the Bible and the church. Um, so counseling, bring a confession. Remind yourself, even if you participated willingly in this trauma and abuse and wounds and whatnot, that you are still a victim in that. Okay. Number four, remember, remind yourself that the world, uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God. I got to choose. I'm not saying hate the world. I'm just saying no, no friendships with the world. And this way, you don't buy the lies of the world. Um, number five, try to think of yourself less. There's a nice quote by, by C.S. Lewis. You see, like I'm telling you, this guy's just brilliant. He said, like, don't think less of yourself. That's not humility. That's not Christianity. Don't think less of yourself. Think of yourself less. Don't say, I'm bad. I'm a sinner. I'm worm. I'm dirt. I'm terrible, I'm horrible, I'm self-hate stuff. This is all what I, 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 so focused on self. Just think of yourself less. The best way to do this is to fix your eyes on heaven. Like St. Paul said, the best evangelist of the whole mankind. He said, what once to do, Philippians uh, 4.13. One thing I do, what is it, St. Paul? Forgetting the things which are behind and looking forward to the things that are ahead. Okay? Um, so fix your eyes on heaven, did or not, broken or not. If you try to walk while looking at yourself, you know, imagine that you're you're walking, but you're looking at like your chest right here. Um, you're gonna like bump into stuff, and you'll trip yourself, and and and. But if you keep your eyes focused on God, focused on the finish line, focused on heaven, you won't be focused on your on your wounds. Now you still have problems. That's why I, the first thing I said is counseling, okay, and therapy, Christian counseling, Christian therapy, um, ideally Orthodox Christian therapy, <clears throat> which is out there. There's a lot of FNP graduates. A lot of the priests know people who can. Some priests actually are graduates of FNP, so that would be awesome. Um, uh, kind of like like a wounded runner. Imagine a wounded marathoner, okay? They're running, they're full of wounds or tears or whatever, but if they keep their eye on their like legs or on whatever they're bleeding or however they fell, uh, chances are they have a much less chance of making it. But if they keep their eyes on that finish line, it will almost help them. I'm, I can't forget the wounds, but maybe kind of dismiss or ignore the wounds. Um, Another thing, remind yourself that many, unfortunately, because we live in a broken world, many people have gone through much worse. Whatever you've gone through, I don't even need to hear it. Many have gone through much worse and are wonderful, healthy people, and they are saints. Um, and also remind yourself that whatever you've gone through, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. I'm not putting you down. I'm not saying you're you know, being weak or a wimp or was he not at all. But just I'm saying this, r remind yourself of this to help console yourself, to comfort yourself. Okay. Um, and remind yourself of, remember the story of vaccinating the kids, of the immunizations? Because I'm sure this person is going, God, why did you allow this? Why did you let this happen to me? Why did you let this trauma, this wounds, this horrible things happen to me? 
And so remember the story of the vaccinations. If you haven't watched it, go back a little bit and watch it. So one of the questions. Also, forgive, forgive, forgive. Forgive the culprits. Forgive the people or the person who did this trauma, who did this hurt, or who did this abuse. Pray for them. By the way, forgiving them doesn't mean reconcile with them or be best friends with them or whatever. Forgive them, release them from this. And the best way to do that, to change your heart towards them, is pray for them. Tell you a funny story. So, so uh, I, before I was a priest, I had uh, a company, a small company, and, and I did that for 26 years. That was the only career I had until I became a priest. And I've dealt with thousands of customers and clients over the years some of them for long periods of time. And there was this one guy that I had to deal with with four years. He was in my life for four years. And I hated that guy. I mean, I hated him. I hated him so much that like, I would imagine bad stuff happened to him. I would picture him dying. I would like picture him dying in a car accident and going through the pain and dying and then like they would revive him and then when he's riding in the ambulance like the door of the ambulance would open and he'd fall out and have another accident and die again or something like that simple okay, i hated this guy so i was like i mean okay we have a problem houston we have a problem i i, I can't live as a christian and have this in my heart god said you know what don't even bother coming to church don't even bother coming to stand before me to pray in your prayer room or in your house or whatever when you have those feet against somebody Go fix things first. You got to get it out of your heart and then come. So I went to my father's confession and he told me something that I was so mad at him. Um, he said, okay, from now on, you're going to pray for your wife and for your kids and for this guy. And I was like, did you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? Pray for this guy. Oh, oh, pray for him. Like, God, show him how stupid he is and show him the error of ways and, like, make him understand what a schmuck he is and all this stuff. It's like, no, no, no. Pray for him. Good stuff. That God, like, just like you're praying for your wife and kids. God says him. Watch over him. Protect him. Surround him with good people who love God and love him. Fulfill the desires of his heart. I'm like, I'm on, look, what am I going to fool God? Like, I, I, I can't trick God. I'll be saying those words, but my heart will be hoping for the exact opposite. He said, don't worry about it, just do it. And you know what we learned? Father Confession said it, I got to do it. I wasn't very happy with him because I didn't want to pray for this guy. It's kind of like Jonah the prophet not wanting to go and warn the Ninevites. I wouldn't dare, of course. Jonah famous famed this. Anyway, so I, I started to do this every day, y'all, and I felt so stupid doing it. Um, but guess what? After about five or six weeks, I don't remember exactly. I mean, this is eons ago, 20 years ago, maybe. Um, I started to mean the words that I was praying for this guy. And actually, little by little, I started to hope for those things for those guys. There's good things. And all the hatred, all the anger, all the unforgiveness just started just dissipating, okay? So this will, when you forgive somebody, you're doing you a favor. You're not doing the other person a favor. I don't know if I mentioned in the last one or not, but I love this quote. It says what? Staying angry at a person or holding a grudge against the person is like drinking poison and hoping the person dies. That's how stupid it is. You're the one with the high blood pressure. You're the one with the ulcers. You're the one who can't sleep at night. You're the one who's grudging around your loved ones. And this person maybe doesn't even know you're mad at them, right? They forgot it. They moved on. So when you forgive somebody, you are doing you a favor. It's tremendous heat to release that person. Um, the last thing I'll say is when you're dealing with all this stuff and you don't know what's going on, you don't know how to get out of it, you, like, you hate your life and everything. I do. Okay, when I'm going through a very difficult situation and nothing makes sense, I cling on to a few pillar facts, a few pillar truths. Pillar, like, you know, if you see like a granite pillar in a church or something, it's like 
solid. Okay, it's not going anywhere. Um, when I was a kid, uh, when we lived, I was born in Alexandria, in Egypt, and, and in, I lived there a few years before I left Egypt in the 70s. And my parents had in their bed this, this painting. And I loved that painting, and I still remember it. And, and, and actually, I asked my mom to bring it from Egypt, and I have it now. Uh, you've probably seen something like it. It's a painting of um, a very stormy sea, like waves and dark clouds. There's these parts of a boat or a ship and like a part of a mass, like broken. Obviously, there's a shipwreck and there's rocks. And then rocks on top of them, there's a cross dot of rock, okay? And there's the woman who is like barefooted and, and the, bottom, bottom, the bottom of her dress torn and shredded like she's been pummeled okay and she's just holding on to that cross like for dear life okay and just not letting go the storm is still going on the disaster is still there there's no other land in sight no other salvation anywhere i'm just gonna hold on to this for dear so when you go through a storm in your life cling on to spillers lot things that are irrefutable that i know that i believe that are never changed and if you really believe this thing, we have a bigger problem. For example, God loves me. God loves me more than I can even understand. He loves me more than a nurse who loves her infant child. You know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, takes the world out and puts your name. Said what, Bob and Ephraim? So let's say, for God so loved Bob, he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved me, Jennifer, for God's love Benjamin, that he gave his only begotten son. Do you believe that if you were the only human being to have ever existed, and, and, and God would have gone through the whole thing for you, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, salvation, all the story of salvation, he would do it for you. You know, if you ask a, a father, Hey, and it was like a few kids. And you say, how much do you love your firstborn? He said, with all my heart. And you say, would you be willing to die for your firstborn? You're like, yes, I would be. How much do you love your secondborn? Well, him, eh. no, no, I'm kidding. The second one, with all my heart. Would you be willing to die for him? Absolutely, in a heartbeat. How about the third? How about the fourth? Okay, do you love all your kids? With all my heart. Would you be willing to die for them? With all my heart, yes. What I'm saying, so God loves me. I'm, I'm, I, I'm going through hell right now. I hate my life right now, but God loves me. Number two, God is all powerful. He can create out of thin air. He can make a dead person rise. He can make bones become people, an army. He can seize. He can, you know, he can do anything and everything, and even the things I cannot imagine. So if he wants to do something about this, he will when he's ready. The fact that he didn't yet, there's a reason for that. And that brings us to the third one. God is all wise. God knows what he's doing. And I trust in that. I rest in that. Um I know this, this, this last one, is, it's like an ocean altogether. You have to know the person, the background, the talking. Uh, but I hope those few steps will help. You know, counseling, bring it up in confession. Remind yourself that uh, you, you were a victim if you were traumatized or, or, any, or abused of any kind. Remind yourself that don't, don't make friendship with the world. Don't trust what the world tells you. Um, Think of, your, of yourself less and keep your eyes on the goal, on the finish line. Don't focus too much on the wound. That's kind of why when they give kids a shot or people a shot, they tell them, what well, look the other way. Or, or, or I remember that when, when my wife was delivering the babies, they would tell, don't, don't look at what's going on, you know, just look at your husband's face. And I would try to smile while she's squeezing my hand like with a grip of death. So don't look at the problem kind of like saint peter if he when he focused on the storm he started sinking when he focuses on god even though the storm is still going on he could walk on it no big deal um remind yourself comfort yourself by reminding yourself that it could have been much worse. comfort yourself by reminding yourself that many other people went through much worse things and they're they've made it they're healthy they're happy they're leading productive lives they are saints 
forgive them, pray for them with the story of that guy. Um, read the story of the vaccines, immunizing the kids. And go, I don't, it doesn't make sense. Like God knows what he's doing. And then cling on to the, those pillar facts uh, that never change. That God loves me. God can do anything. He can't talk to and God knows what he's doing. He's all wise. And I believe we finished answering all the questions for the Florida youth and where else is in the meeting with us. Um, does anybody have any follow-up questions or comments or anything? No, thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure. Um, I will uh, post uh, one video is done being decoded or whatever, I'll post it on the Holy Cross YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and look up Holy Cross Coptic Orthodox Church, uh, and then you can see the questions and their answers and everything. God bless you all. Let's go ahead and pray in the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit on God. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you because there are answers to the questions. Um, and history kind of repeats itself. Uh, actually, even Satan's tricks and his wounds and attacks, they're the same one as with Adam and Eve, and they're just maybe packaged a little bit differently. Um, I thank you that there are answers for our questions. Father, I thank you for the courage of the people who ask the questions. I hope that the answers uh, will provide some resolution, or some comfort, or some peace. and. Uh, I hope that this encourages them to keep asking and to keep learning and to keep growing, but also to make the decision that when things don't make sense, I'll cling on to those pillars and will not go of my faith because I am Orthodox Christian. We ask you to please hear us for the intercession of St. Mary and all you see some others. So please, from the beginning, with the mighty power of your love, giving cross the blessings of the glorious days of your holy resurrection. Please, the Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And let us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten, Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. The communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. God bless you all. We'll talk to you all some other time. See you in Florida sometime. Yeah. <laughs>